All right, hello everyone, and a big welcome to all of you to the inaugural SAG GSC dissertation lecture. I would say good afternoon, but one of the greatest advantages of online events is the ability for anyone to join from around the world. So no matter what time it is where you are, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, gathering virtually also means that we come together from many diverse places. And at this time, we invite you to recognize with humility and gratitude, the traditional stewards of the land you currently occupy and from which you are able to join us today. We invite you to take a moment to think about the space that you are in and to thank the traditional caretakers of that land. We recognize that land acknowledgement is not about the past, but is part of a living, breathing, present and a just future. Reconciliation requires the recognition of past and present injustices, as well as our coming together to build and protect a better world. Care for both the land and for our fellow people cannot be solely the work of ancestral caretakers, but is everyone's responsibility. Particularly today, Earth Day, we recognize our shared responsibility for stewardship of the natural environment, reconciliation and decolonization, and ethical engagement with the histories, material cultures, and stories of those who came before us. My name is Rachel Dewan. I'm a current PhD candidate in art history at the University of Toronto, though I'm joining you today from Skagway, Alaska, the traditional lands of the Tlingit peoples. I'm also the outgoing chair of the AIA's Student Affairs Interest Group, or SAG or SAGE, one of the two student groups sponsoring today's event. And I'm thrilled that after many months of discussions, brainstorming, planning with the SCS's Graduate Student Committee, or GSC, this event is finally here. I would particularly like to thank the GSC for their partnership in this event and their support of my enthusiastic brainstorming amidst a turbulent year. This all began a while ago. I don't think we fully knew what would happen. Um, and my particular thanks to Dell and Stephanie for early discussions and most especially Meredith Miller, my co-organizer and partner in this endeavor. So I'll turn it over to Meredith. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that uh, warm welcome. I'm Meredith Millar, a current PhD student in classics at New York University and a member of the Graduate Student Committee within the SES. I'm really thrilled to see this event come to fruition after many months of work and the invaluable contributions of numerous people and organizations. This was an idea that really took root in the wake of the January 2020 AIA SES annual meeting when our two student organizations realized that there could be more substantial and formalized opportunities for overlap in the things that we do. A primary commitment of both of our groups is to uplifting and celebrating graduate research. The final stages of work on a dissertation represent an incredibly liminal space in the life of a PhD student, taking that next step and relinquishing their work into the scholarly world. With this lecture as a platform, we hope to provide some stability and amplify exceptional work on the cusp of its publication. None of this, of course, would have been possible without the continued support of both the AIA and SES, who we are so grateful to say provided an honorarium to support this lecture and to support the scholarly work of graduate students, which has historically been overlooked. The insight and assistance of these two organizations has been central to getting things ready for the inaugural lecture. And we look forward to many years of future lectures to come. I'd now like to take a moment for a few words from the co-chairs of our two organizing student groups to highlight some of their other opportunities and initiatives within the broader ancient world community. Um, we'll begin with Amanda Kane Chen of the Student Affairs Interest Group. Thank you, Meredith. And thank you all for attending this exciting inaugural stage slash GSC lecture. I am Amanda Chen, a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland. And I, along with my incoming co-chair of the Student Affairs Interest Group, Caitlin McCullough, would like to welcome you all. We are so grateful to the organizing committee for putting this event together, the AIA, and of course, Elizabeth. The Student Affairs Interest Group, or SAGE, is an interest group of the Archaeological Institute of America dedicating to promoting student scholarship and concerns, and is open to all. We have recently kicked off a new membership and mentorship program and invite you to follow our Instagram page, studentaffairs underscore AIA, where we are currently running a giveaway contest, as well as our Facebook page for any updates. 
I'll now turn it over to Caitlin for a few more words. Hi, I'm Caitlin McCullough. I am a PhD candidate at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and as Amanda said, thank you all for coming and thank you to our amazing speaker. Um, we invite you to check out our website, studentaffairsaia.wordpress.com for more information or reach out via email at studentaffairsaia at gmail.com to join our mailing list. Uh, I highly recommend joining the mailing list. Uh, that way you won't miss any announcements for summer events and you'll be in the know about our interest groups, meetings at the upcoming annual meeting of the AIA. So thank you all. And I will turn it over to Chris for the next section. Good day or good evening. I'm Chris Gibson at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, PhD candidate. And I'm also one of the co-chairs of the SCS graduate student committee. First, this wouldn't be possible without the input and collaboration with SAGE. And secondly, the graduate student committee is very thankful for the hard work of Meredith who represented the committee and served as our public face. Uh, just a brief note on the graduate student committee itself. This is only our third year as a formal committee with the SCS. And therefore it's such a delight to see this collaborative celebration of graduate research and persevering under Herculean circumstances. I also want to plug the Graduate Classical Caucus, a burgeoning SES affiliated group. And the goal of this GCC, as we're calling it, is to have a network of graduate students who study the classical world. Through it, graduate students can discuss their issues as a region and ultimately relay those concerns up to the Graduate Student Committee. The idea is for each university to have a liaison who can communicate with a representative of their region and make clear to the SES what's going on with their grad students. Not only that, there are some plans to make regional graduate conferences easier to organize and generally connect graduate students in the whole region since it's not always easy. If you want to know more, you can send me a message or get in contact with Meredith and we can connect you with your Graduate Classical Caucus Regional Representative. I will put the website and my email in the chat. I think it will be visible, I think. And with that, I want to hand it back to Rachel. And again, thank you everyone for being here and especially thank you to Elizabeth for sharing your hard work. Thank you and big thanks to both of our student groups for all that you guys do to have student voices heard. Uh, and now before I turn it over to Meredith to introduce our lecture, the reason we're all here, uh, just a few housekeeping items. So the lecture will be about 45 minutes after which we'll open up the floor to questions. Uh, and if you wish to ask a question, please type it into the general chat or the Q&A chat. Uh, the general chat will go to everyone if you choose all panelists and all attendees, otherwise just we'll see it. So just a heads up. Um, and we will make sure that your question gets asked at the end in the Q&A section. All right, thank you. Okay, and moving on to the main event, it is with great excitement that I introduce our inaugural lecturer, Elizabeth Heintges, a PhD candidate at Columbia University. She received her BA in Classics from Reed College and joined the MA and PhD program at Columbia shortly thereafter. Her dissertation, Between Myth and Memory, Sicily in Roman Literature, 1st Century BCE through 1st Century CE, examines ancient literature regarding Rome's first province through the framework of mythology, cultural geography, landscape, and memory. To better contextualize her work, Elizabeth has excavated in the field at Morgantina and has conducted further dissertation research while in Italy. Beyond this dissertation, Elizabeth has been working regularly with Columbia's Olcott Collection, a teaching collection of antiquities brought together by George Olcott, Columbia's first lecturer of Roman archaeology. In addition to cataloging the Roman Republican coins in the collection, Elizabeth has been working for several years on its unpublished Latin and Greek inscriptions. She also received the graduate student internship in primary sources, at Columbia's Rare Book and Manuscript Library and had the opportunity to work extensively with the papyrus collection held there. Elizabeth has delivered conference papers at the SES annual meeting, CAMWIS, and CAPN. 
She has acted in the Barnard and Columbia Ancient Drama Productions, co-organized the Classics Colloquium series, and coordinated the Center for the Ancient Mediterranean. Currently, she is a preceptor for Columbia's core curriculum, Teaching Literature Humanities. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth as our inaugural lecturer this afternoon. Thank you so much, Meredith and Rachel and uh, Kaylin, Amanda, Chris, and everyone uh, from SAGE and, and the uh, uh, GSC. It's, it's just such an honor to be here. Um, a little nervous. Uh, I'm pretty excited. So uh, thank you all uh, who are in the audience for coming. Um, and I will just attempt, attempt to share my screen and you will suffer through what my students suffer through every day. <laughs> Okay. So, in Book 10 of the Institutio Oratoria, the Order's Education, Quintilian makes the following remark while assessing the merits of the poets that formed the Roman literary canon. Cornelius Severus, even if he is a rather better versifier than poet, would nevertheless have had a strong claim to second place after Virgil, if, as has been said, he had finished his Sicilian war to the standard of his first book. While Quintilian can't help but make a rather pointed dig at the poet in question, he nevertheless establishes that the first book of Cornelius Severus's hexameter poem was outstanding enough to rank him ahead of all other epic poets, barring Virgil himself. Well, what was this amazing poem? From his contemporary and friend Ovid, we learned that Cornelius Severus was a rather prolific poet. His bellum siculum was likely composed in the final years of Augustus's reign or under Tiberius. Uh, Seneca the Younger lists him after Virgil and Ovid as yet another poet who embraced the challenge of writing a tour de force description of Mount Etna. In the wake of these tantalizing tidbits, it becomes all the more disappointing then to learn that Cornelius Severus's poetry has survived only in fragments, none of which has been identified as belonging to the Bellum Siculum itself. Yet the absence of the Sicilian War in surviving historical epic does not preclude its presence in Augustan poetry more generally. While explicit treatments are largely limited to recusationes or passing references in the more overtly political poetry of Propertius and Horace, I would posit that Sextus Pompey and the war over Sicily loom rather larger within the literary and cultural fabric of Augustan Rome. In my time today, I will explore some of the resonances between the late Republican Bellum Siculum and the Sicilian episodes of the Aeneid. Contemporary accounts of the war fought between Sextus Pompey and the Triumvirs between 42 and 36 BCE are largely absent from the historical record or otherwise follow the influential characterization of the race gestae. I'm going to begin first by providing an overview of some of the historical context so as to situate us before moving on to a closer examination of the Virgilian epic, namely books three and five of the Aeneid. As a result, We'll see how considerations of contemporary material sources and later historiographical narratives in conjunction with the epic text offer new insights into the dynamics at play between Virgil's mythical Sicily and its very real and recent past. So who exactly was Sextus Pompey and what role did Sicily play during the twilight years of the Roman Republic? In literature and scholarship alike, Sextus Pompey has often been denigrated as a pirate rather than a significant actor on the Mediterranean stage. This is largely due to the outsized influence of Augustus's characterization in Reis Gestae 25, Mare Pacavi a Predonibus, I brought the sea under control from pirates. This paraphrastic and elusive reference to the Bellum Siculum culminating in the Battle of Naulicus in 36 BCE reduces the extent of this major civil conflict to a war fought against pirates and the enslaved. Moreover, the formulation effectively subverts Sextus's relationship with his father, Pompey the Great. While Pompey had famously rid the Mediterranean of pirates on behalf of the race publica, his son here becomes the routed pirate himself, while Octavian Augustus takes on Pompey's role. 
And we'll return to this familial dynamic in a bit. Most contemporary literary sources are likewise derogatory or even silent on the question of sexist Pompey. Later writers in turn often take their cue from the official narrative promoted by Augustus, not only in the race gesti, but presumably in his memoirs as well. Another rendition of Augustus's version of events may have also appeared in verse. Suetonius states that one book of hexameters was composed by Augustus, quote, of which the subject and title is Sicily, unquote. However, even with this rather hefty source bias, there remain significant indications in our major historiographical sources, Appian and Cassius Dio, that Sextus Pompey was far more than a mere pirate or adventurer, as Simon called him, and a much more substantial threat to the triumvirs than previously supposed. As a way into this, I'd like us to look at a rather illustrative passage from Cassius Dio, book 48, on the situation at Rome in 40 BCE. And I read from the slide. As for the people in Rome, since Sardinia was in hostile hands, the coast was being pillaged and their grain supply had been cut off, while the famine, the many taxes of all sorts being imposed, and in addition, contributions assessed upon those owning slaves all distressed them terribly, they held their peace no longer. As much as they were pleased with the reconciliation of Antony and Octavian, for they thought that concord between these men meant peace for themselves, they were equally or even more vexed at the war they were waging against Sexus Pompey. A short time before, they'd led the two men into the city mounted on horses as if at a triumph. At the present, however, they changed their behavior to a remarkable degree. At first, when they met at various gatherings or came together to witness the spectacle, they would exhort Antony and Caesar to secure peace. And at this, they raised loud shouts of approval. And when these leaders would not heed them, they were alienated from them in favor of Sextus. They not only kept up a general talk to foster his interests, but also in the circus honored the statue of Neptune carried in the procession with loud applause, thus expressing their great delight in him. And when on certain days it was not brought out, they drove those in charge from the forum with stones, threw down their statues, and finally, when they could not accomplish anything even in this way, they rushed violently upon those men as if to kill them. Caesar, although his followers were wounded, tore his garments and turned himself to supplicating them, whereas Antony bore himself with more violence toward them. And when, chiefly because of this, the people became angered, and it was feared that they would even commit some act of violence as a result, the two were forced against their will to make overtures to Sextus. So in this episode, Dio establishes several factors at home that led the triumvirs to participate in the Pact of Misenum in 39 BCE, which brokered a peace, however short-lived, between Octavian, Antony, and Sextus Pompey. While the episode operates on several levels within Dio's narrative, it also offers a glimpse into Sextus's reception at Rome, a somewhat different picture from what we see in the race gesti. There are a couple points here that I'd like to highlight. First, the grain supply and the famine, and two, the statue of Neptune. Upon taking control of Sicily at the end of 43 BCE, and then subsequently Sardinia as well, Sextus imposed a naval blockade on Italy that first and foremost prevented the importation of grain from Rome's agriculturally rich Western provinces. Before the incorporation of Egypt in 30 BCE, the provinces of Sicily, Sardinia, and Africa were the major sites of grain production. While the blockade was already a substantive threat to Rome's food supply with potentially devastating consequences, it was likely exacerbated by two additional factors, one environmental and one geopolitical. So in a study published last year, a team of researchers posited that an extreme climatological event took place during the second half of the first century BCE that likely contributed significantly to widespread sociopolitical change. Well, I don't wish to go so far as to say that this brought about the end of the Republic, the eruption of the Alaskan Okmok volcano in 43 BCE appears to have produced major shifts in temperature and precipitation levels across the Northern Hemisphere that would have had a significant impact on agricultural production. If Sextus's blockade were accompanied by crop failure of any degree in the Italian peninsula, 
the consequences would have been dire. Moreover, the property confiscations undertaken during the prescriptions and after Philippi, as well as veteran resettlement, which would continue well after Actium, would have further destabilized Italian communities and land use, a phenomenon that is explicitly addressed in both Virgil and Horace's poetry. In Dio's narrative, as in Appian's, the distribution of the grain supply and the attendant famine incite desperation and even violence. Sexus has the upper hand, it seems. Why exactly then does the crowd applaud the statue of Neptune? Um, barring perhaps uh, Dio's unintentional pun, topu posedonos agalma pompeon. Um, so according to Cassius Dio here, quote, after gaining control of Sicily, Sextus built more ships and dominated the sea roundabout. And he assumed a certain additional glory and pride by representing himself to be the son of Neptune, since his father had once ruled the whole sea. Dio's account is somewhat corroborated by Sextus's coinage. In a series issued for Sextus by one of his supporters, Quintus Nasidius, at some time after 43 BCE, we find an undeniably distinct portrait of Pompey the Great on the obverse accompanied by marine symbols, that is a dolphin here and a trident, and the legend on the left bears the name of the god Neptune, Neptuni. For the sake of comparison here, I provide a side-by-side -side with the Gliptotech uh, portrait of Pompey. Although the syncretism uh, on the coin is most clearly visible, uh, or syncretism uh, on this issue is most clearly visible on this denarius, both Neptune and Pompey the Great, or some combination thereof, are constant features on subse Sextus's subsequent issues. Sextus's apparent adoption of Neptune as his father was also commonly recognized and criticized among his contemporaries. In Epode 9, Horace paraphrastically refers to Sextus as Neptunius Dux. Neptune was not uncommon among other late Republican actors. We find very similar portrait heads to that found on RRC 511-2C on the denarii of Casca Longus, minted for Brutus, um, and this is RRC 4072, and that of Lucius Statius Mercus, RRC 510-1. Yet Sextus's association with Neptune and the sea brought an additional dimension that not all could automatically draw on, that of Pietas, both toward the gods and towards one parents. Pietas had served as a watchword at the Bauel Munda and also became even more important for Sextus, as we'll see in a bit. While Sextus's apparent popularity as the protector of prescribed citizens is not on full display in the previously discussed passage, we nevertheless can see the potency of his name and one of his major symbols, the marine deity Neptune among the people of Rome. That Octavian and Antony are forced to capitulate to the demands of the people in Dio's account demonstrates that Sextus posed a real threat to the other power brokers in the Roman Mediterranean. More specifically, Sextus posed a particular threat to Octavian himself, whose fleets he repeatedly crushed at naval engagements at the Strait of Messina between 42 and 38 BCE. An epigram recorded by Suetonius in his life of Augustus lampoons Octavian's losses. Quote, after he has twice been beaten at sea and lost his ships, he plays at dice all the time in the hope of winning one victory. After two devastating defeats in 38, Octavian and Agrippa rebuilt the fleet and prepared assiduously for the next engagement at the newly constructed Portus Iulius in the Bay of Naples. Finally, in 36, their naval forces engaged and overcame Sextus's fleet, first at Milae and then ultimately at Nalicus. A shipwreck discovered in 1991 off of Capo Palmo, west of Messina, has been identified as a potential casualty of one of these battles, likely due to fire damage uh, sustained on the basis of large quantities of lead objects that were found fused together. While the timbers did not survive and no rostrum was found, the outfitting of the ship, bronze fittings, uh, some very fancy ones of which you can see here, uh, unmatched lava millstones that were used for ballast, um, and the presence of 20 lead glandes missiles or sling bullets confirm its status as a warship. The wreck was dated by the presence of 49 bronze and silver coins the vast majority of which are Sextus's Sicilian issues dating from 42 to 36, 
or otherwise earlier coinages of Pompey the Great. Also among the wreck was found a bronze lunate strip with a punched inscription reading, I don't know if you can see, CN, possibly a P Magno. While the object is still the subject of some debate and nevertheless securely ties the ship to the Pompeian presence on Sicily in the 30s BCE. In 2008, just around the corner from Capo Rezzo Pomo Rec, the Superintendenza del Mare identified and was able to raise a Roman ship's rostrum. Known today as the Aquiladroni Ram, this large rostrum still had significant portions of timber preserved. Although the wood has been carbon dated to the late third to second century BCE, the excavators have suggested that the time required for curing the timber combined with the iconography of the sword decoration visible here support a dating of a ship in use uh, in the mid to late first century BCE, possibly making it too a casualty of Nalicus. While he received an awatio, not a triumph for the victory at Nalicus, the Sicilian naval battle was a watershed moment for Octavian. It firmly cemented his military position and likewise offered fruitful opportunities for exploring strategies of self-representation and promotion. As we learn from Appian, upon his return to Rome, he received the following honors voted by the Senate. An ovation, an annual festival on the anniversary of his victory, and the erection on a column in the forum of a gilded statue of him in the clothes he wore when he entered the city with the rams of ships positioned around the column. And the statue was put up bearing the inscription, quote, peace long disturbed by civil discord he restored both on land and sea. This rostral column may be reflected in the one depicted on this denarius of 29 to 27. The inscription reported by Appian reflects or anticipates what will become a recurring slogan after Actium, pace parta ter terra marique, a phrase that is also used on the Actian Victory Monument. Uh, and there are a few other correspondences between some uh, uh, dedications and uh, constructions after Nalicus and those of Actium, and I'm happy to talk about those later. Um, recent uh, studies, uh, particularly those spearheaded by Catherine Welch and the late Anton Powell, have done much to recover the substantive role that Sextus played in the 40s and 30s BCE and the wide scale of popularity he seemed to have enjoyed as the son of Pompeius Magnus, an inheritor of the Republican class, however defined, and a protector of the prescribed. By focusing in particular on the small yet incredibly rich numismatic corpus of Sextus Pompey, with support from the narratives of Appian and Cassius Dio, we are able to witness the unique interplay between the appropriation and suppression of Sextus's iconographic and ideological program undertaken by Octavian after Nalicus in 36 an interplay that is likewise mirrored in Virgil's poem. So with this broader context in mind, let us turn at last to Virgil. All of Virgil's poetry, whether epic, Georgic, or bucolic, is deeply interested in the geographic landscapes that dot and define the literary space of his poems. In the Aeneid, space and place take on additional meaning. Virgilian landscapes do not serve merely as the backdrops for poetic actors. Instead, they play integral roles in narratives, embody critical themes, and participate in the production and reproduction of memory and cultural hegemony. The island of Sicily is one of these crucial landscapes. Not only does the principal action begin in medias res off the Sicilian coast, Vix e conspectu siculae telluris in Book 1, line 34, the epic narrative returns to Sicily twice more over the course of the poem in Books 3 and 5. So why does Virgil keep bringing us back to Sicily? At the crux of this question lies the word meta. A meta at the most basic level is a, common, a conical object like the meta sudans. Um, more specifically, it often signifies the cone shaped turning post that stood at either end of the circus. More broadly, meta can denote a goal, a turning point, a boundary or a limit, metaphorical or otherwise. Over the course of the Aeneid, the term appears 10 times, six of which are in Sicilian contexts. The repeated association with Sicily invites us to look beyond the literal meta, the turning point in the ship race of the Aeneid V. As Sally Spence and others have argued, the race and Book V itself, standing near the center of the epic, 
are likewise turning points within the narrative and the poem as a whole. Yet given the context and the terms first used in the poem and Jupiter's speech foretelling Rome's empire without end as the limits to which this imperium will not be subject, Sicily qua meta deserves further consideration. In the history of the Roman Republic, Sicily itself was the crucial turning point, the geographical and ideological stepping stone for Roman intervention and expansion beyond the Italian peninsula, in my view at least. Early in the Barines, Cicero figures Sicily as both the praeceptor and ornamentum of Imperium. The island is not only the jewel in the crown as a rich and fruitful province, but it also occupies a didactic function as the place where Rome learned provincial governance and extension into the wider Mediterranean world. It is in the context of this dynamic that Virgil activates the more contemporary resonances in his poem integrating features of the recent past into his conceptualization of Rome's beginnings and perhaps ends. I will look first at, at two prominent examples of this phenomenon in book three, Scylla and Mount Etna, before moving on to book five. Virgil figures the reader's first extended interaction with the island of Sicily, not directly in real time, so to speak, but through the lens of Aeneas's extended narration to Dido. Book three follows Aeneas and his Trojans' wanderings in the wake of Troy's fall as they travel over the Mediterranean in search of their new homeland. At Buthrotum, the new Troy, Helenus the seer advises Aeneas about the journey that remains ahead of him. When providing directions on how to sail to Cumae, Helenus warns Aeneas of the dangers of the Straits of Messina, occupied by the monstrous Scylla and Charybdis. In the Homeric model underlying the scene in the Odyssey, Circe likewise warns Odysseus about the dangers of these two obstacles, yet she presents Scylla as the lesser of two evils. While Scylla might pick off Odysseus's sailors individually with each head, Charybdis couldn't destroy the entire ship and crew in a single blow. In contrast, Helenus advises Aeneas to avoid the straits altogether, insisting instead that he keep to the left, uh, make for the land on the left and the seas on the left, long though the circuit be. Flee the shore and waves on the right. While Helenus acknowledges the dangers of Charybdis, his framing and description suggests that he views the hybrid female monster as more of a threat. Reiterating his earlier advice to keep left, Helenus recommends it's better to slowly round the promontory of uh, Trinacrian Pachinus and double back on a long course than to see or hear Scylla and her hounds. Why does Scylla pose such a threat? For Virgil's contemporaries, Scylla would have had an additional resonance, one stemming not merely from the realm of myth, but from that of recent civil strife. During the wars of the late 40s and 30s, coin iconography served as a potent and crucial dynamic medium for political messaging across different factions. As we have already seen with the adoption of the Pompey as Neptune type, among one of the hallmarks of Sextus Pompey's Sicilian coinage is an insistent stress on his command of the sea. Scylla had never previously featured on a Roman coin during the Republic, though she does make an appearance on some South Italian and Sicilian coins of the fifth through third centuries, but she appears not once, but twice in Sextus's silver issues. On one coin type seen here, Scylla is placed front and center. On the reverse of this denarius, RC 511-4, we see a dynamic Scylla in motion, wielding a rudder behind her head, ready to strike. Her human torso surrounded by her theriomorphic features slithering tails at her side and barking dogs emerging from her groin. As has been frequently noted by scholars, the coin types produced during the civil wars tend to be more overtly charged with particular contemporary resonances. In this case, not only does Sextus Pompey boat of, boast of his maritime prowess through the inclusion of his title, Prefectus Classis et Ore Maritimae, Prefect of the Fleet and Coast, a designation bestowed upon him by the Senate ex Senatus Consulto in 43, one that he continued to use uh, even after he was um, incorrectly uh, 
tried under under the lace media um, and then the subsequent struggle with the triumvirs. But it seems likely that this type refers to a specific maritime moment, one probably in the vicinity of the Straits of Messina and Scylla's supposed lair. Two possibilities, depending on the dating of this coin, emerge. Sextus's victory over Salvidianus Rufus in 42, a notorious episode that ended in Sextus supposedly reenacting his victory in a Naumachia in the Straits of Messana, or alternatively, his victory over Octavian's fleet at Scylaeum in 38, an instance where the Triumvir's ships were also devastated by windstorms, according to our sources. Sextus has deployed Scylla here as a symbol of his control over the Sicilian waterways and the power of his fleet. Jennifer Garish has recently argued that the figure of Scylla in the Sicilian digression of Book Four of Sal's Fragmentary Histories is an intentional and pointed allusion to none other than Sextus Pompey. In the same vein, I propose here that Hellenus's emphasis on Scylla's dangerous and pointed reworking of Circe's speech should not be ignored. It is with this conjunction in mind that we perhaps can finally make sense of Appian's description of Octavian's actions during Salvidianus' battle with Sextus in 42. And I quote, listening to news of these events, Octavian sent Salvidianus in command of a naval force to sail along the coast and destroy Pompey, assuming it would be an easy task. Him himself made his way across Italy um, with the intention of joining Salvidianus at Regium. Pompeius met Salvidianus with a large fleet, and a naval engagement took place between them at the entrance of the straits near the promontory of Scolium. On his arrival at Polaris, where Salvidianus had retired after the battle, Octavian gave his solemn assurances in person to the people of Regium and Hipponium that he would take them off the list of victory prizes, for he was particularly apprehensive about their location right on the straits. But when Antony appealed to him as a matter of urgency, he sailed over to him at Brindisium, keeping Sicily on the left, and Aristerae echon Sicilian. So Brian McGing, in a footnote, footnote to his new Loeb translation, remarks, quote, this looks like a mistake. Unless he, he sailed the long way around the western end of Sicily, the island cannot have been on his left. Taken by itself, Appian's story of Octavian going the long way around Sicily to Brindisium seems perhaps far-fetched. Yet read, when read in conjunction with Hellenus' insistent admonition of Laiwa Laiwa, Anise's nice sensible choice to forego the mythological gauntlet of Scylla and Charybdis becomes more potent. While we might have figured Octavian's refusal to sail through the straits as an act of cowardice, Anise's avoidance not only involves self-preservation, but also the preservation of his fellow Trojans. The subsequent Periplus of Sicily allows Virgil to flex his taste for Hellenistic geography, but refigures and reverses Octavian's Periplus in this more benign fashion. While there's plenty more to be said about book three, I would like us here to focus briefly on Virgil's use and description of Mount Etna. As the Trojans sail down the eastern coast of Italy, they spy Mount Etna emerging procul a fluctu, line 554. As commentators have noted in strictly geographical terms, there is a certain lack of realism in the Trojans seeing Etna before the Straits themselves. Yet Virgil's choices concerning geography are always intentional. Why figure Etna before and above all else? Countless articles have been written about Virgil's description of Etna. And while I leave you to explore Alice Gellius's comparison of Virgil's Edna to Pindar's on your own or any number of other topics, the crucial point here is that the volcanic Mount Etna here stands at the border of chaos and cosmic order. It lies atop the giant Enceladus as a prison, but the giant's unsettled movements and rumblings beneath the earth cause the volcano to thunder and erupt. The volcano is powerful and dangerous, unstable, its menacing never ceases. In Virgil, as in many other ancient poets, it is both wild and untamed natural forces like the storm in Aeneid I and the rebellious giants who often figure in allegorical depictions of or symbolic references to civil strife. Mount Etna had already long held this resonance before Sextus Pompey came along. Yet it works doubly perfectly in context the Sicilian mountain now stands in for the Sicilian war. In Virgil's poem, however terrifying the bellows and fires of the volcano may be, the giant remains contained. 
Sicily then, by a kind of mythological geographic determinism, as a piece of Italy once ripped from the mainland uh, in the ideology we're given uh, by Virgil and Strabo and others, is an ideal or expected place for civil war or rebellion. Yet under Jupiter's reign, or so to Augustus, it remains pacified for the moment. As one last note on Etna, I do want to invite us to consider not just the mythological volcano, but its real life counterpart, particularly in light of the impact of the Okmok eruption in the late 40s BCE. While the devastating effects of that Alaskan eruption would not have necessarily been visible, an active and eruptive Etna would have been. While volcanic eruptions and other cosmic phenomena often figure as literary tropes, namely as prodigies in historical narratives that often signal disaster or dire change, and that also happens to be an extraordinarily active volcano, as anyone who has spent a significant amount of time in Eastern Sicily can tell you. Our literary sources report volcanic activity on Etna at several crucial, crucial junctures in the late Republic, such as in March of 44, in conjunction with Caesar's assassination, um, and notably for us on the eve of Nalicus. Appian reports, Harsh cracks came from Etna and long rumblings and flashes that lit up the army, with the result that the Germans leapt from their sleeping places in fear, while the others who had heard the stories about Etna were convinced that in such extraordinary circumstances, the lava too would swamp them. However cliched the topos might be, the fact remains that the living volcano manages to transcend the temporal boundaries of Virgil's narrative. It exists in the mythical past, in the historical past and likewise in the present. As an entity somewhat outside of time, Etna looks forward to the similar collapse of time and space that we see in book five. In the time that remains today, I'd like us to focus in on one small episode in book five that I think believe serves as a productive case study for understanding the temporal dynamics uh, and other dynamics at play in Virgil's poem. Book five was characterized by a friend of mine as the, quote, boring sports book, unquote, of the Aeneid, a title I soundly reject, takes place in and around Western Sicily. Aeneas and his Trojans join with Acestes and his Sicilians to celebrate games in honor of the one-year anniversary of Anchises' death. In recent years, scholars have sought to divest Book V's ill-fated reputation by offering nuanced readings of historically inflected moments in Aeneid V whether the Augustan circus spectacle considered by Andrew Feldherr or the battles of the first Punic War in Tom Biggs and Nora Goldschmidt's work. While there is far more in book five to discuss than we have time today, I hope that by limiting myself to this small episode, some of you might be convinced that book five is worth reading after all. The episode in question, the ship race off the western coast of Sicily that dominates the funeral games for Anchises which has long invited a range of interpretations beyond the intertextual. As was discussed prior, the race not only can be read as a temporal and narrative turning point, but likewise offers paradigms of moral behavior, good and bad, in a lower stakes environment than that of the rest of the epic. The Trojan ship captain who wins the race, Cloanthus, finds a parallel in Aeneas himself, as he ultimately triumphs due to his pietas and proper supplication of the gods. In line with the other Sicilian moments of the epic that we have examined today, I propose that Cloanthus should be read not only as a counterpart to Aeneas himself, but as an evocation of sexist Pompey in the Bellum Siculum. And uh, bear with me, I know a few of you have, have heard of, uh, some of this in the past as well, so I hope there's something new for you here. At least three aspects of Virgil's Cloanthus suggest correspondences with Sextus, his ship, his pietas, and his cloak. When examining these three features in tandem with other sources, we see once more how even seemingly minor characters or moments in Virgil's Aeneid may instead occupy a much more substantial significance. So the first potential resonance between Virgil's church and captain and the historical Sextus Pompey is Cloanthus's ship. Before the race begins, Virgil provides a brief catalog of the ships and the respective captains. Four ships chosen from the whole fleet and equal in their heavy oars enter the first contest. Menestheus leads the Pristus, swift due to its keen oarsman, Menestheus soon to be Italian, from whose name comes the clan of Memmius. And Gaius drives the huge chimera with its huge mass, the work of a city, which Dardanus push along in three tiers. 
and the oars rise up in triple order. And Sergestus, from whom the Sergian house holds its name, is conveyed in the great centaur. And on the sea blue Scylla, Cloanthus went the clan for you, Roman Cluentius. This genealogical catalog allows the poet to bridge the gap between mythological past and Roman present by linking the competitors with contemporary Roman gentes. Nestius with the Memii, Sergestus with the Sergii, and Cloanthus with the Cluentii. Leave aside guys for now. The Servius gives him an affiliation too. Apart from Sergastus, whose descriptor Furin's anime elsewhere seems rather appropriate for the ancestor of Lucius Sergius Catalina, the reason why these particular gentes might have been signaled out by Virgil is by no means apparent. Today, I leave aside the question of a Cluentius analog for Cloanthus, and instead would suggest that this genealogical moment also activates the possibility of correspondences with other components of contemporary Roman history through a generic figure. In this reading, it is not Cloanthus as Cloanthus that matters, but rather the name of his ship, the Scylla. So all four ships here bear names that evoke mythological monsters, uncontrollable and dangerous forces, threatening peace and order. Menestius is Christus, the sea monster, Gaius is Chimera, Augustus is Centaur, and Cloanthus is Scylla. The monsters evoked by the ships have, in some sense, been tamed. The power of their forms and names harnessed in service of human naval achievement. We might think here too about how these dynamics compare to those at play with Mount Etna. Cloanthus' Scylla is notable here, as we have already heard much about Scylla in Book 3. While Aeneas and the Trojans never face the monstrous Scylla directly, these two Scyllas are nevertheless further conjoined by the adjective used to describe the ship, Caeulea, sea blue or dark blue, the same word that is used of Scylla's hounds in Hellenus's description in Book 3. While the monster's mythological credentials make her inclusion among Virgil's ships acceptable, the contemporary symbolism of Scylla that has already been at play in Book 3 invites us to also read the ship race along the coast of Sicily with an eye to Sicilian affairs of Virgil's lifetime. So now let's turn to Pietas. Pietas occupies a central role in the Aeneid. It is not surprising, especially in book five, a book that is in large part oriented around the relationship between children and parents or leaders and subjects. After book six, it's tied with book one for the greatest number of appearances of the noun Pietas and its associated adjective Pius in the entire epic. While the nature of Pietas in the poem or even in just this book is far beyond my scope today, Cloanthus's demonstration of Pietas erga deos deserves closer consideration in light of the resonances activated by his Scylla. So towards the end of his race, uh, of the race, Gaius and Sergastus have been effectively removed from the competition, leaving only Menestius and Cloanthus racing neck and neck. In the end, Cloanthus pulls out all the stops. He extends his palms to the sea and calls upon the marine gods, promising them a sacrifice and libation. In exchange, it's understood for victory. Cloanthus's entreaty, unlike Menestheus's passing invocation of Neptune and his earlier exhortation to his crew, is successful. The gods of the sea all hear him, and Portunus pushes his ship swiftly and safely into port. Two interrelated features of this passage stand out. Cloanthus's pietas and his connection to the marine deities, both of which were defining features of Sextus Pompey's expressed ideology and the reception thereof. Sextus's association with Pietas was crucial to positioning himself as a pious avenger of his father, Pompey the Great. We see this clearly on some of his early denarii from Spain, such as RRC 477-1A, which features a portrait head of Pompeius Magnus on the obverse, surrounded by a legend uh, naming Sextus. Uh, on the reverse, we see the personification of Pietas, who is so named. Sextus's professed familial piety extends not only to his father, but also to his brother, Gnaeus, who was killed at Munda, as an aureus of 42 to 36 attests. A lot of these dates, there are a lot of debates about how if we date these, uh, some of these coins early or late, um, and we can also get into this in the Q&A. Uh, Sextus wears the beard of mourning on the offers, while portraits of his father and brother face one another on the reverse. Um, and we can note too that Sextus appears to uh, 
be surrounded by the Corona Civica, uh, referencing uh, the fact that he saved citizens from prescriptions. Perhaps the extent of Sextus's association with Pietas goes so far that he actually adopts the cognomen Pius, which appears on the vast majority of his coinage, as we see here. It's likewise attested in the epigraphic record, such as on this inscription from Lula Bayam, uh, dating uh, between 39 and 36. This strategy enabled Sextus to capitalize on his father's name recognition and authority, providing him with the necessary credentials to obtain both popular and financial support around the Western Mediterranean, particularly after 45. While Cloanthus's pietas towards the sea gods and Sextus's familial pietas might seem to diverge, they are in fact wholly intertwined. As we have already seen, Sextus assimilated his own father, Pompey the Great, with the sea god Neptune. To return to Virgil, Cloanthus does not explicitly evoke Neptune. His invocation casts a wide net, nor is it Neptune who offers divine assistance. If Portunus, the harbor god responsible for propelling his ship to the finish line, is here called father, pater. While pater is not uncommonly used for male gods in Virgil, its appearance here in book five with its stress on parenthood cannot be a coincidence, particularly in this context. Portunus can be seen as a Virgilian substitute. Cloanthus within the microcosm of the ship race does not merit the assistance of a Neptune, however Pompeian he may be. Instead, we know that Neptune's aid has already been marshaled for Aeneas himself for calming the storm in book one, and again at the end of book five. So Clemis. Following the end of the ship race, the magnanimous Aeneas distributes prizes to all the competitors. The cloak that Cloanthus receives as the victor has drawn attention from scholars predominantly owing to its ornamentation, an ekphrastic scene of Ganymede's apotheosis. Instead of looking at the ekphrasis, let's take a look at the actual garment upon which the ekphrastic scene unfolds, the clamus. So the clamus, uh, a short cloak fastened by a brooch, was a garment of Macedonian origin, commonly associated with travelers, hunters, and horsemen. It also in turn became the Greek military cloak par excellence, and likewise is often seen in depictions of Alexander the Great or other Hellenistic ruler portraits, such as those portrayed on the slide. While it appears to have Ro a Roman counterpart, the paluda mentum, a red or purple cloak also fastened by a fibula donned by mil military commanders, the clamus nevertheless re remained a distinct garment in a, a Republican period. In the pro-Riberio, Cicero defends Riberius' wearing of the pallium by citing other examples of Roman men donning Greek dress, including the clamus. Uh, he cites Sulla, as well as a statue of Lucius Scipio on the Capitol, I believe. So for Virgil's Trojans, Greek dress is of course appropriate. Indeed, the clamus appears multiple times in the Aeneid as a particularly Trojan form of attire, often in, in the context of leadership. Yet it also has a foreboding undercurrent. Almost all the characters who wear a clamus, barring Cloanthus here and Ascanius, who is gifted a clamus uh, in book three, end up dying, as does Camilla, who only covets Chlorius's cloak in book 11. If we are primed to see the resonances of Cloanthus's character with his Republican counterpart, the clamus here recalls the special clamus that Sextus is said to have worn in order to signal his favor by Neptune, as seen in this passage from Book Five of the Appian Civil War. According to Appian, Sextus exchanged the scarlet cloak, clamus, that is customary for commanders for one of dark sea blue, to signify, of course, that he was the adopted son of Neptune. So an obvious problem of translation exists here. Lack of Latin sources for this anecdote make it difficult to determine if a clamus, a polodimentum, or some other kind of cloak is actually indicated. Dio, in his version of this episode, uses the word stole. But it seems that the traditional, in any case, the traditional polodimentum or a similar clamus has been shed in favor of a dark blue clamus. That Sextus's cloak was indeed a clamus is possibly supported by the feature of one of his coins, the central figure on the reverse of RRC 511-3, a nude statue of Neptune or possibly Neptune as Pompey with the cloak draped over the left arm is almost certainly wearing a clamus. 
In its coloring, Cloanthus's cloak bears more resemblance to the Westus triumphalis. And we have already encountered Sextus's signature dark blue in another object, the ship itself. The adjective kairuleus is virtually synonymous with the Greek adjectives used by Appian and Dio, kyanos, kyanoides, to describe the clamus. Just as the blue of Sextus's clamus signaled his privileged status with respect to Neptune, we may perhaps think of the kairuleus scylla as being proleptically shaded. It will be similarly privileged by the gods and thus victorious. Over the past decade, scholars have increasingly noted the importance of understanding Virgil Sisley in light of the conflicts of the First Punic War. Indeed, the connection between the ship race that we have just been exploring in the Aeneid V and the First Punic War did not go unnoticed in antiquity. Servius, commenting on the start of the boat race uh, added in the Aeneid V, line 114, notes, during the Punic War, First Punic War, um, the Romans established first the Naumachia for the purpose of training, after which people judged them to be extremely capable in naval combat as well. In this contest, the poet makes many allusions to this matter. I should also point out here that the very waters in which the boat race takes place off the western coast of Sicily correspond roughly with the location of the deciding naval battle that ended the First Punic War, uh, the Battle of the Aegidi Islands in 241. Roman naval victories of the period appear to have garnered renewed interest at the end of the first century outside of the realm of literary production. Given Augustus's engagement with commemorative monuments for Gaius Duilius's victory at Milae in 260, Duilius was the first Roman general to obtain a triumph for a naval victory, in this case over the Carthaginian and Sicilian fleets uh, at Milae. His triumph was accompanied by the erection of a triumphal monument in the Forum, a rostral column with an accompanying inscription. The inscription seen here is not the original of the third century, but what many scholars believe to be an Augustan period restoration, likely prompted by Octavian Augustus himself. Octavian's interest in creating a correspondence between himself and Duilius and between the victory at Milae uh, in 260 and Malachus in 36, two locations very, very close to one another, extended to the construction of his own rostral column in the Forum, as we've already discussed previously. Um, and I should, of course, also mention that Duilius numbers among uh, the Sumiwiri who are uh, in the form of Augustus, and here's uh, the elobium uh, for Duilius, parts of it. I think there's one small fragment down here that's missing. So in light of all this, if we return once more to Augustus's very elliptical treatment of Sextus Pompey in the Res Gestae, Mari Pacavi a Perdonibus, with the resonances in Virgil uh, and the uh, numismatic evidence in mind, we ultimately can trace a rather complex dynamic of erasure and appropriation. On the one hand, Sextus has been essentially obliterated from the historical record, reduced to a character of predation. On the other hand, if we look more closely at other sources not subject to the editorial whims of a strong man, we find what appears to be a very conscious effort by Octavian to appropriate elements of Sextus's iconographic program even before Nalicus. So this is once more best demonstrated on the coinage. Uh, an aureus uh, minted at Rome in 42 by Lucius Livinaeus Regulus combines the head of a young Octavian on the obverse with a rather familiar image on the reverse, a younger man carrying an older one on his shoulder. The tendency has been to read this scene uh, in, in, in the past as Aeneas and Anchises, what would later be Virgil's emblematic scene of Pietas. Yet as Zaro uh, convincingly argued almost two decades ago, these figures are far more likely to be drawn not from the Trojan cycle, but rather from a local Sicilian story, an exemplary tale of the pious Catanian brothers who saved their parents from the volcanic flow of Mount Etna. This episode is also featured on one of Sextus's own coins from the same period. Uh, you see the two one of the Catanian brothers on one side, the other on the other, and they're both carrying one of their parents. So Octavian's coinage, therefore, is engaged in what might be a, a battle of one-upmanship with that of Sextus and other late Republican actors, seeking to lay claim in some fashion to a narrative of Pietas for his own program. Following Sextus's defeat at Nalicus, we also see Octavian appropriating other elements of Sextus's potent iconography. 
So this is a somewhat controversial coin, but the art reverse of RIC 256 uh, dating between 34 and 29 features a male nude figure with a clamus, hey, holding a scepter and then a cluster or a stern ornament with his right foot surmounting a globe. This figure has been interpreted by some scholars as Octavian, as Neptune. Um, just as the victory analogous gave the right to reclaim Neptune's favor for his own, uh, so too can he now subsume and adapt the Neptune on Sextus's coinage for his own purposes. Sextus's apparent popularity and effective iconography made him not only a dangerous opponent, but one that could not be completely ignored. If we return to Virgil uh, in the ship race in particular, we find a similar dynamic. Cloanthus, our Sextus stand in, has been somewhat minimized. Sextus's Scylla in book three becomes a tourist attraction that can be skipped, or in book five, a ship in a playful Namachia rather than one uh, engaged in naval warfare. The Pieta is demonstrated by Cloanthus's exemplary, but it's just a mere reflection of Aeneas's own. And the favor of the god of the sea, the principal god of the sea, is not accessible to him, but to our Trojan hero alone. So Virgil's poem ends up participating in a similar process to that of Octavian's, a tacit acknowledgement of the potent political and ideological force that was Sextus Pompey. And I would just add, because I ran out of time in my talk and I wanted to go into this more, that you know, uh, uh, one aspect of this kind of engagement, simultaneous engagement with both uh, Sextus and Nalicus and uh, these moments from the first Punic War is that what is a potentially problematic Sicily, the rebellious Sicily, the threatening Sicily of Mount Etna, it can be reworked as a triumphant landscape uh, of what should and could be an exemplary Roman province under Octavian Augustus. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, uh, for that excellent talk. Uh, you really have just opened our eyes, I think, to Sextus Pompey and his representation in Roman material, literary history. Uh, there's a lot for us to consider moving forward, no matter our disciplinary background. So at this time, um, for any attendees, we'd like to open up the floor for questions, which can be typed into the Q&A and will be read out by either myself or by Rachel. So it looks like we already have a few. Um, our first question reads, this was a dazzling discussion. Thank you so much. Two questions, but for the sake of time, please feel free to pick the one you like best. Oh, I should have pre-read this one, but it just popped up. Um, I think we can probably do both of them. So the first question is, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the Scylla imagery that, you cap that your caption mentions in one of the first coins you showed, the one with the trophy. Unless I misheard, I think you said this one also commemorates a victory in the Straits of Messina. Does this figure into your argument concerning the later coins with more obvious Scylla imagery? So question one. Okay, so should I go ahead with that one or? Sure thing, yeah. And then we can do the second one. Minimize my PowerPoint so I can actually find this point of question. So thank you so much. Um, this is a great question. So yeah, so the, the coining question uh, is another one of these Sicilian issues. They're all, uh, there's a very big debate between uh, a number of numismatists whether to date these coins to the, the early years of the conflict between Sextus and, um, and the triumvirs. So pre Mycenaeum, the treaty at Mycenaeum in 39 or after dating to 38 to 36. And, it's often assumed that the content of the iconography of these coins should in some way respond to that, the period in which uh, it was produced. So in terms of being associated with Scylium in particular, um, that uh, the victory in 38, when Octavian's fleet is essentially just decimated against the rocks, there's a a whole bit in, in both Dio and Appian about how just the winds and the storms are overwhelming. That's another nice uh, overlap with a needed one perhaps. Um, but that uh, if we date these coins to 38 or uh, anytime thereafter, right, we can see that uh, correspondence really, really nicely, right? It becomes not just a naval trophy, um, kind of incorporating all of these very 
nice, normal kind of every everything you could ever want in a naval trophy is there um, in addition to the, the the incorporation of the skull if we did it earlier right i think it might be you know a an acknowledgement of of Sextus's, uh understanding of his role within the sicilian kind of sphere in the mediterranean right but not necessarily in direct reference to that particular um kind of naval victory if that if that makes sense as an answer Excellent. Yes. And the second question uh, within this first question is Aeneas's avoidance of the Straits of Messina is often taken as a meta literary gesture, sig signaling Virgil's wish to avoid treading the same ground, so to speak, as Homer's Odyssey. Your interpretation could dovetail quite nicely with this, but I'd love to hear how you think it through. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, a really perfect uh, combination and maybe like a, a better reading than kind of my uh, strained attempt to kind of read Affian into this episode. Um, but I mean, I think, you know, I can't, I can't help. I mean, I think just the, the insistence on, on left and then the same thing that we see this like very strange moment um, in Affian is, is really suggestive. Um, and I think there's a, I've talked to you, uh, Sally Spence has, has written a bit about this uh, as well. Um, I don't know if it's impressed, but about uh, Aeneas uh, is Periplus um, and Octavian's Periplus kind of in, in conjunction as a way of demarcating Italian or Roman territory, right? So as a way of incorporating uh, Sicily into uh, the you know, geography of, of Roman Italy. Um, which ends up happening several centuries later uh, with kind of re redistricting. Um, but so which which feels a compelling reason also to me to kind of understand these uh, issues operating um, in tandem rather than just necessarily being a, a metapoetic or a meta literary reading. Excellent. Thank you. So our next question. Um, this is a really this is really interesting and I have learned a great deal. Have you seen the article by Carl Anderson and Keith Dix in Virgilius 2013? It discusses the knowledge of Virgil in his depiction of rowing, which may come from watching the fleet's train. I think this would add to what you are discussing. Yeah, I have I have read that article and it's it's been very helpful for me as someone who has been on a boat all of one time. Um, so it, it's definitely taught me a lot about how uh, kind of rowing operates and especially kind of it within these um, kind of race contexts as well. Excellent. Um, so our next question, thanks for sharing some of your research. It is a great project. Lots I could ask, but perhaps I could press for your additional thoughts on an episode you mentioned in connection with several passages but didn't dwell on today. Neptune slash the Statesman and the sea storm off Sicily in Aeneid 1. How do you read it within your wider approach to the epic's engagement with Sicily and memories of Sextus? Yeah, so, so this is a big question, right? And I definitely avoided talking about it uh, for a reason. But thank, thank you so much for this. And, and you know, uh, Tom, I know you have written a lot about this, so I really bow to your to your knowledge and expertise uh, on this. Um, I think I, I have been thinking about it in relation to um, an episode, I think that is in Suetonius, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, right, about Octavian kind of having rejected Neptune um, explicitly, right, or, you know, I think it's another version of, of the Dio episode that I sort of started off with today of the of the statues in, in the circus, but kind of reworked. Um, and it's almost as if he were throwing Neptune away. And then at, at a certain point after Nalicus, with Actium, right? Neptune is reclaimed into the program. I think there's a really beautiful intaglio, right? That sort of shows this, a, a gem in Sardonyx maybe uh, of, of Octavian as Neptune, you know, in a chariot pulled by hippocamps that I think kind of really encapsulates that for me um, in particular. Uh, so I think, you know, Sextus, uh, Sextus and Neptune, right? Pompey, first off, is, is not a problematic figure necessarily for, for Octavian either, right? He figures in among the 
the great men in the, in the forum uh, of Augustus. Uh, he is, you know, not necessarily vilified in any way. So in that sense, right, even if Sextus is uh, the son of, of, of Pompey the Great, if Pompey's Neptune, right, why, why can't Octavian make, make you use of him as well, right? He's a, he's a perfectly valid um, kind of model uh, for maritime, not conquest, say, but maritime success. Uh, and I don't, I, want, I don't want to say necessarily governance, but uh, that, that can be incorporated into this, this larger program. I think that was very all over the place. But. <laughs> And our next question, um, I'd like to ask about the treatment of Neptune in book one as a political commander and its relationship to Augustus's propaganda. Let's grant that Augustus appropriated Neptune along with other aspects of Sextus's propaganda and iconography, but how could any reader of Virgil, especially so early in the reign, know that this was to be read in the context of Augustus's appropriation rather than Sextus himself? In other words, doesn't that treatment lay open the possibility of a Sexton as well as an Augustan reading? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I actually like that framing in, in a much better way in, in, in a sense that, than my own, right? Because it doesn't, um, you know, force uh, the, the, so the Sexton, right, to, to rely upon the Augustan or, or the Octavian, uh, Octavianic um, reading. I mean, I think, uh, in terms of, yeah, I mean, I think I, I probably threw around the word appropriation, which I also don't necessarily like to use because all of all of these, uh, you know, images are part of a much larger uh, symbolic and visual vocabulary that's floating around, not just between these two actors, but kind of within the last two decades prior to uh, this conflict, right? These are recurring, I mean, Neptune is maybe, yeah, as, as I mentioned, appears on several other coins uh, of this period, uh, minted for Brutus uh, and uh, other Pompeians, um, but also in the preceding decades as well. So, I mean, it's not necessarily, one shouldn't necessarily see it as just a solely a, a direct uh, interaction between Sextus uh, and Octavian Augustus or an appropriation thereof, but rather uh, as part of this larger dialogue of which Sextus and Octavian happen to be the most visible and prominent at, at this moment in time, perhaps, or most palpable uh, for me in my readings. Excellent. Um, so I'd actually like to ask a question of my own, if that's all right. I think it was the, the second denarius that you showed maybe um, that looked like it included a celestial object, which is really intriguing thinking about Sextus Pompey uh, and, and the divine parallels that are going on. But also given the role of the sky in navigating the open Mediterranean, have you come across references maybe to which celestial object this could be? Is this purely something that we should be reading from a navigational, like Neptune as navigator parallel, or, or do we read the celestial iconography um, from a more divine, in, in the way that maybe Augustus takes up the, the celestial object, divine components in that way? Yeah, that's an awesome question. And something that I actually, I really haven't thought about at all. I don't think anyone has, as far as I'm aware, and maybe I'm just looking in the wrong places, ha has written substantially about uh, the the star that is appearing on those coins of Quintus and Sidious. That could be just because they are very rare coins. Um, they are few for the one I showed is more common, but there's another uh, type that has four four shifts on the back in a in a naval battle, and I think there are only eight existing copies of that coin type. So very rare. Um, I mean, I think there is a, a, a lot of really interesting possibilities here, right? Nep Neptune as uh, helmsman, right, gubernator, and, and kind of being able to, to guide the ship uh, and ship of state. Uh, as it were, uh, we can think about, yeah, the dynamics with the, the, the star of Julius Caesar, right, and the potential dynamics between what it means to be claiming oneself as a, as a son of a god. Uh, or a potential god in this period as well. So, I mean, I think 
Yeah, that's a whole other avenue. Maybe you should write an article on that, about this. Um, I would be really interested in reading that. I'll, I'll certainly consider it. This, uh, this lecture has, has really just opened up a lot of thoughts. Thank you again. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, I guess last call for any final questions for Elizabeth. Um, otherwise, we'll give her one last round of virtual applause for such an amazing, engaging lecture and a first inaugural SAG GSC dissertation lecture. So thank you again to the AIA and the SCS for their support of this event, including the AIA's technical support on this Zoom. So thank you, Kevin Mullen, behind the scenes. And many thanks to all of you for coming. So with that, we will sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming and thanks for listening and thanks for having me.